The best advice is, I think I've already stated this, but get work experience, get an internship, get an opportunity to see what the job is like, how to apply, how to negotiate. All of that is super important skills that you should try to at least get before you graduate. Welcome to the Chemical Engineering Guys podcast, a show in which we share stories and tips from chemical and process engineers. We talk about student and professional life, as well as important aspects of products, processes, industries, and companies. But more importantly, what are the paths that these unique individuals are taking in this ever-changing world? Let's get started. What's up, guys? Welcome once again to a new episode of the Chemical Engineering Guys podcast. This time, I am with Daniel Vosburg. And he is currently working as a automation engineer in the pharmaceutical industry. So, Daniel, can you let us know more about you? Uh, where did you start it? Why chemical engineer, maybe? And how did you end up in automation? So, I guess the, the, the real starting point for me was way back in high school when I took AP Chemistry. And I had an awesome teacher who really kind of stoked my interest in the in the subject and i've always known i've been very math and science oriented and well it was like well i like chemistry but i also like math and it seemed like a nice fusion so i basically after i finished high school i went directly into university and already major already declared never changed it um and then just you know kind of pushed through the path and no no regrets really <laughs> And how did you end it with automation? Because that's, I think it's a field that chemical engineers don't like that much or don't end up working on that. I think it's only like a set of skills that we have there pending to be exploited yeah, just in case you end up in that specific uh, field. So did you search for it or how was it? So yeah, the, the, the next stage that kind of defined an, on, on what direction I was going for was when I entered university, which I went to Northeastern University, by the way, in Boston, Massachusetts, they have this class that all engineers have to take. So it's not specifically chemical focused, but what it does do is it has a huge focus on programming language like C++ and MATLAB. I don't like MATLAB, but... <laughs> and I just remember having just a lot of fun with that. So I'm like, I'm going to pick up a computer engineering minor. And there was that that kind of influenced. And what really kind of solidified me going into automation engineering was the fact that on my first round of co-ops, so maybe I should diverge a little bit and talk about that. So Northeastern has a co-op program, and it's probably one of the strongest in the country. They've got a lot of good relationships with a lot of neighboring companies. And so as part of the curriculum, you're, you have to have at least two co-ops in order to graduate. So when I was going on my first one, it was uh, like like for any circumstances where you're finding the job for the first time, it's it's difficult. But I was able to leverage the fact that I had a computer engineering minor or, or was going for one when applying to um, specifically uh, New England Controls. Uh, they're called NECI now, but yeah, they 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 were like, oh hey, you're a computer engineer. We have a position. It doesn't require too much, you know, effort. And that's what that's where I started. And then from there, it just kind of compounded like. My next job would then be leveraging the fact that I worked in automation engineering. And you know what? I thought it was a good opportunity to merge the kind of chemical engineering and computer engineering aspects of my curriculum. Okay. That sounds great because I also have friends that work a lot with the computers and end up in simulation, maybe fluid. That was the other path. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's get back uh, to the university times. So Daniel, did you have any other like alternatives? Did you apply to other universities or did you always wanted to go to Northeastern <laughs> University? The, the, whole, the whole thing was a, was a rather stroke of luck. So I had three reach schools, three safety schools, and only two match schools. Um, if you're not familiar with the terminology reach, meaning it would be very hard for me to get in match being it's kind of neutral and safety schools being it's easy to get in but i wanted to round it out with a third one so i i was i looked up northeast and i'm like yeah it's probably good enough but when they accepted me they gave me a really good scholarship and then the more i looked into them i'm like wow they have like the second best chemical engineering program in the state i'm going for it and uh that turned out to be a very good decision Okay, that's great. What was that you, besides the scholarship, 
what what's the problem about or why did you decide that it was a good syllabus was it because of the co-ops or at the moment where you were more focused on maybe the curriculum I'm not sure. I think I think it was it partly was the the they have the really good chemical engineering program, but I mean a lot of it was again I didn't have better options. I applied to RPI, but they literally lost half my application, so they weren't able to give me any financial aid. So that was kind of off the table, and then I don't think I got into my other match. So, but I mean again, I'm I'm not I'm not I'm not saying that this was a bad decision by any po points. I it turned out to be a lot better than I thought it would have been. Being in school or let's say university, what did you enjoy the most? The the typical subjects in chemical engineering, or were you maybe inclining more into the computer aspect? I think I had different. I think different kinds of fun in in both computer and chemical engineering. I might piss off some computer engineers here, but I thought it was generally a lot easier for me. I just tended to coast through on the projects and I found it just kind of easy fun, like pr pretty relaxing. While well, chemical engineering was a different kind of fun, it was a lot more challenging and definitely pushed me harder, which I enjoyed. Yeah, I think almost every engineer could, in theory, code and learn programming because the basis is pure logic. Absolutely essential skill. I don't... I, I'm on board with that comment that maybe you find it chemical engineering a little bit more difficult because it's a little bit more abstract and some things are not that straightforward. You cannot always relate to real life or something physical. And logic is always either is it correct or wrong. And it's always finding the problem. Why is it not converging maybe? Or what's the which, in which line you can find the error? So that's definitely interesting on that Something I want to ask you, Daniel, at the moment, did you know or knew that co-ops were important or did that program was like a uh, just nice to have there, the two co-ops that you got there? So I, I, I heard like co-ops, they're big, they're really important. And I was like, yeah, yeah, they're, they're probably just some university selling point, but they're probably, you know, useful in some aspect. And then I actually went through the program and I am just going to like just hammer, hammer, hammer home how great the program was, how great it is to have that kind of work experience, to be guided through the process of applying to a co-op, to have that sort of university connections that you can rely on. Like this wasn't just like, like I have, a, I, have a, I have some other friends who go to chemical engineering schools and a lot of them are just like, you have to have an internship and then they're like, go at it. And they don't give their students any support. But in Northeastern, it is so baked into the curriculum, and they, you know, again, the university has good connections that it was, it, it, it gave me such a leg up. And you know, I feel like I'm just shell shilling for my university, but like, this is my honest feelings. It was so great. No, no, it's, that's fine. Actually, what we want to hear is that exactly stories from the graduates, because if you don't recommend it, I, I'm pretty sure you were not going to say, yeah, it's great, but well, it doesn't work for me. So if it worked for you, and I also think the co-ops are now getting each time more important. If you were to compare it with someone that only did maybe one internship and you have a full co-op curriculum, well, as an employer, I will go straight forward with the guy that went to the industry and took more into the professional side rather than the academic side. So that's my opinion, that's what I will say. But what do you think, Daniel? Do you think co-ops are overrated or do you think definitely they work or they are a heavy weight on the resume? They are such a heavy weight on the resume. So my, my go-to example is the fact that on my first co-op, even, even with all the university support, it still took me three months to get a co-op. On my second co-op, it took six days. <laughs> and... I, it was a significant rate, and, and I got a raise in terms of wages. Let's talk about your co-op. How did you got it, the first one? So the first one, again, I mentioned was at, at NECI, and that was a lot more of just code testing. Like I said, it was kind of my first internship, so I didn't work on anything super critical, but it was a good introduction to kind of the sort of the automation side of the bar, biopharma space. So, you know, just, you, you know, equipment modules, control modules, working with, you know, bioreactors at a large scale. The second co-op was was a little different in that I was actually working more of a small startup. NECI is a pretty big company, fairly big. But um, the startup, there was 24 employees, eight of which were co-ops, 
which is a rather interesting uh, business business model. But you know, whatever they 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 seem to keep doing it, so it must work. But that was in more in the PAT realm because I felt like maybe I wanted to aim for something that uh, leveraged a little more of my chemical engineering background. So worked a lot more directly with the chemicals. So I was I was doing work, say, like putting together specific mixes of substances that I could use analytical equipment on and then use my more computer engineering background to then build the models for those analytical equipment. Okay, so this PAT is the second co-op, right? PAT was my second co-op. And the, oh yeah, and this was at Continuous Pharmaceuticals, which is up in Woburn. Okay, so what do they, they do and what did you do as a co-op? So they were, I, oh God, it was, it was in 2018 and I, I, I completely forgot the drug they were making, but their basic idea was to take traditional batch processes and make them continuous. So they had a whole like pilot plant and stuff. And I was just, I was the PAT person of working with a lot of infrared spectrometers, other spectrometers. I worked with a conductivity probe for a while. And also just because 24, because it was such a small company, I had to do a lot of other more miscellaneous jobs. And, you know, everyone had to. And how did you got the, because you said that three months, the first co-op versus six days, the second co-op. What, what was the defining factor or, or was it only because you had a previous experience? I, I, I entirely believe that was his previous experience because they use the same software at Continuous as that, uh, sorry, let me, let me back up a little bit. The software that NECI makes was the same software that Continuous was using. So I was I was able to leverage that. But even even disregarding the fact that I was able to use use that, I had a lot more callbacks initially when I was applying to the to to all the different places, and I I never got that when I was uh, during the first round. So yeah, I really think it's just having that prior experience is just so important, and being able to talk about it, like you know, I actually did things. It wasn't just I had a job. Yeah, that's true because when you go now in the, let's say, workforce and you're interviewing and so on, at least you have something else besides uh, saying, I, I went to un this university, I have this GPA, this was my, I don't know, my club, my extracurricular. In this case, you have something to be proud of. Maybe I work in this program, I work with this software, I was leader of this project. Well, maybe not leader, but I was part of this uh, team mm -hmm. or, I don't know, you have something extra. So that's why I, I always... We'll recommend if you can take some experience before graduating, always recommend it. In both of my jobs, I was able to talk a little bit about with, with some of the people who were responsible for the hiring process. And in both cases, one thing that they said was that if your GPA is higher than like a 3.2 or a 3.4, then they don't care if you've got like a 4.0 compared to a 3.6. As long as you've surpassed that threshold, you know, you've, you've already proven that you're good academically. What they're more looking for is, again, that additional experience or, as in the case of my first co-op, the fact that I had the minor. Yeah, having something extra or also soft skills. Maybe you don't have that experience, you don't have that minor, but you have a okay GPA and you go, you get invited to the interview and you just rock it. Maybe you get along with the superiors, with your boss, with the HR consultant maybe i don't know there's also extra things that go besides the gpa i will say that maybe the gpa is just the filter for the computer for separating like low gpas versus high gpas or medium level gpas and then you go and have these interviews so daniel did you have a lot of interviews were they telephone interviews in person interviews yeah normally the the model was you would get a phone interview first and then you would do an in person interview Occasionally, you would go straight for the in-person interviews. That was more common for larger companies that had like recruiters on campus who would do, who would do large batches. Okay, okay, that's great to hear. Because I I also think that in person you have more of an opportunity to give a better impression than in telephone. Even though in, in telephone is is still better than just sending a paper that will be scanned, and it's very hard to relate with someone in paper. Well, I, I find that in-person in interviews are harder than phone interviews just because, I, I, I don't know, I get a lot more nervous. <laughs> <laughs> that's why, that's why, because you, you will see how the interviewee is uh, getting along, maybe nervous, maybe he's confident, maybe he's like smiling always, or maybe he's 
not even having eye contact. I don't know. You can say a lot of things just being in the same room, not even talking with him, uh, being present with someone in the room. You see a lot happening. Once uh, that you graduated, did you already knew you wanted to go to automation or were you open for anything related to maybe coding with chemical engineering or maybe you wanted something in specifics? What was your thought at the moment? So at this point, I knew I was going to land somewhere between PAT and automation because those were my previous two experiences and I still really enjoyed the work doing that. Honestly, more of the deciding factor was the fact that my current job was originally an internship. So like I said, I had the first two co-ops and then my internship was kind of separate because I had just some time off from university and I was and I wanted to go on my own for 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 that. And I it was another automation job and I loved the company. It was definitely my favorite job so far. So after I finished the internship, I talked with my With, with, with the company and my, my bosses, and we got it so I was able to work part-time, not the next semester, but the following semester, which was my very last semester at university. And so that was great. And then as soon as I graduated this, this April or May, I forget which, I just went straight to full-time. And that, that's, that's kind of where I am now. What's the name of the company? I work at Vertex Pharmaceuticals in, in Boston. They're, they're pretty big in the CF cystic fibrosis uh, field, but they're, they're, they're doing a lot of expansion now. They recently released a really big drug called Trikafta and it, it got approved in, in Europe. So they're, they're doing very well for themselves. Okay. That's great. Well, if they do great, maybe the employees also do great. So Daniel, now let us know more on what do you do day on day before COVID maybe <laughs> and after COVID? So my, my, my job mostly has is, is, is stayed the same. I may mostly support their commercial operations. So working with, again, you know, sort of general automation, continuous manufacturing, because they had this, that's partly what led into that was I worked at continuous pharmaceuticals and they do continuous manufacturing at Vertex. So that was nice. But I also support some other lab instruments that they have there because they use a lot of the same, you know, bench scales for, for different units, use a lot of the same automation technology, and those need to be supported just as much as the big things that are actually making the drugs. So, Daniel, I see here that you have a master degree. I do. How was that? Did you have first your bachelor or do you have these programs in which you get bachelor and master degree after one extra term? So the way that Northeastern works is that, or at least the way that chemical engineers at Northeastern work, is that you have three options for how you want to go through your curriculum. You can do four years and two co-ops. You can do five years and three co-ops, or you can do five years, two co-ops, and a combined master's. And over the course of that latter half, you Uh, it, it, they're they're mixed so i was taking undergraduate and graduate classes at the same time because again that's that's the program i picked there's also a gpa requirement but it wasn't too high and for the master were you allowed to focus into automation or it was a generic master for everyone yeah it was a generic master's for everyone i don't think they really had the bandwidth to specialize although i will admit i didn't look too much into it Yeah, also that program was I was the I was part of the last group that actually could do that program. They scrapped it and replaced it with another one where you weren't able to mix graduate and undergraduate classes. You had to complete your bachelor's in four years and then an extra year for your master's. Okay, still still nice, right? In five years you get your master, and eh. some co-ops. I still prefer the fact that I was able to mix. It was a little hell on the bureaucracy side, but it, I like it, it gave me a lot more flexibility. And Now that you have a master's degree, what's it in chemical engineering? Yep, just chemical engineering. Will you search maybe for a master's degree on automation or control, artificial intelligence, big data, something related? Um, I don't think so at this point, mostly because of finances. You know, chemical engineers are generally not not in want for money, but a chemical engineering degree is still very expensive. So at the very least, I'm going to be laying low on the education side for a while. I'm happy where I am, and I don't really see the, a huge need for it. But I'll keep an eye out for any kind of opportunities that may present. Now, after COVID, you said that your actual work didn't change that much. Was it 
what did it change? Only that you are now at home, but still working mostly online, or what? What was the change? Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm still working mostly online. I'm still talking with with you know all my colleagues. Still doing similar work. The only main difference is that yeah, every now and then, like every week or two weeks, I will head on site to do something that I can't do in person. Anything that you know, dealing with hardware. Yeah, true. Yeah, always. Chemical engineer gotta eventually go to the to the manufacturing plant, right? Yeah, or the lab because I I do some of that work too. Ah, really? And when you move, say the lab, is it a like a pilot plant or why do you say lab? Standalone unit operations. Mm, okay, okay. Mm, I don't know if you, Daniel, can you let us know more on what a automation engineer do, do what they can maybe experience or focus on because I, I think we have this very generic idea of what automation is, especially in the chemical engineering side, which is making the equipment work automatically. And of course, having some control for pressure, temperature, flow rates, and so on. But let us know directly from someone that, that's in the, in the field, what do they do in general? On, on sort of a, a general level, automation is is again, taking inputs from your process and then using them to define how your output is going to be and making sure it works in a consistent and reliable way that, as we all know, makes the F FDA happy, at least if you're, if you're American. <laughs> There's always a FDA agency in different countries, but yeah, why is that? Why FDA is, is stronger or what? Is it the requirements or why? So yeah, again, if if you're making anything that goes into the body, injectables, consumables, you know, whatever, you need to make sure, like the, the the FDA is there to make sure that whatever product you're making is not going to hurt or harm your patients. And a lot of what what kind of defines that is how your drug is manufactured, and how your drug is manufactured depends on on your automation system. So there is a lot of so. I, I can't say from personal experience what it's like in other industries, but I would probably assume that it's one of the most he doing stuff with biopharmaceuticals is probably one of the most heavily regulated uh, industries. And you have to make real sure that your code is is tracked, you know, make make sure everything is 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 recorded. Uh, it's you can't just go in and change things in your production environment. Okay, yeah, I, I can imagine that pharmaceuticals must be very regulated because well, I just said it, it's going to end up in the human body and you don't know what's going to happen. So thanks to the FDA, because in many other countries, the FDA is like the standard. So if the FDA approve it, we will approve it in our country. So it's kind of awkward as a, I don't know, having this agency, which is not government regulated in our country, let's say. That is the standard, but we trust it. Let's see how it goes in the future. So it's still good business to like not poison your patients. <laughs> um, I remember reading some or watching some presentation that was like, um, generally speaking, patients will hold companies at a higher standard than regulators will, which I found a, a, little, a little weird, but I guess it's true. But yeah, there's also a lot of difficulties because, like I said, mentioned before, I'm, I've done two jobs in continuous manufacturing, and it's 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 a new field. And part of the 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 problem with that is that regulators don't have much experience with that. So it's there's there's a lot of caution there, and it's a lot there's a lot of pressure placed on the company that they have to prove to the regulators in this sort of novel way that you know the process is, is going to be safe. But still, generally, con continuous manufacturing is safer it produces less waste it's smaller cheaper it's just harder to to set up i have a question daniel do you see yourself in other industry uh which is not pharmaceuticals doing automation yeah yeah um i've you know i've got a lot of colleagues who are in automation and some came from like ceramics or, or whatever and yeah there's a lot of cross flow it's it's harder what i hear it's harder to get into biopharmaceuticals from outside but once you're in biopharmaceuticals it's pretty easy to go to any other place yeah i think because of the regulations that you already work in something very hard which a lot of regulations so it's way easier to go to another industry which does not have that many regulations yeah if, if you screw up your ceramic manufacturing line yeah that's money lost but at least no one's being hurt <laughs>
Exactly, exactly. Okay, Daniel. Well, I don't know, Daniel, can you share us something else? I mean, I'm reading right here that once you had a dream, you flew to Chile, but didn't pack anything. <laughs> so that was kind of uh, interesting to hear from you. So let us know why. What was that you wanted to share with that? I don't know. That was the first thing that popped up into my head at the time. I always feel like I have to be prepared, so I, I feel like I get I, sometimes I get nightmares about not being prepared. But that also sounds kind of cool, just going to a country and, of course, it kind of be, as you said, nervous and unprepared, but also this side of adventure and and going just enjoying and see what happens. That's also. Cool. I really hope we get some COVID vaccines soon so I can actually go traveling, yeah. Okay, yeah, me too. I'm also waiting for at least maybe not the COVID vaccine, but open the, the borders in some countries that I want to go. My brother is in Korea, so I want to visit him. But if you want to go there, you need to stay two weeks in a quarantine facility, which uh, I don't know if you, I fly one month, it will be half of, of the time being in a prison. So it doesn't sound nice. Mm -hmm. Daniel, I don't know if you want to share something else or shall we pass to the quick question section? Uh, no, I don't think there's there's much else to to talk. Well, I mean, there probably is. I just doesn't prompt my brain in the right way to just think of it like that. But yeah, we can move on to the quick questions. Okay, nice. So the first section in the questions will be student life. And if you could go back in maybe to, to your university times, what would you change and why? So there's this organization in America called AIGE, which is American Institute of Chemical Engineers. And it wasn't, I'm not sure if, how much of this was my fault and how much of it was, I was just not properly communicated on it, but it, it, it it's apparently a really good thing to leverage. They've got a lot of online certifications that you can take that can really spice up your resume. And I just did not leverage any of that at all. I didn't realize that I needed to like sign up and like get on some mailing lists. But yeah, I really would have been a lot more active in that group. Yeah, I actually remember getting access to that because as a student, it was free. I don't know if it was one semester for free or something like that. And actually, I saw a lot of courses, but I never had the courage to take them because I was also lazy and I didn't want to, to spend time on that. I also thought that oh, it's a lot of time. I should be focusing on my actual courses in the university rather than these uh, courses online. But yeah, it definitely is something to check out some certifications. So going back to the example, if you have no internships or co-ops, at least have some extra tools to go and work for. So Daniel, second question, what would you add to your syllabus? Which courses do you think are relevant that you are missing? You know, you mentioned how it would have been nice to get like a like an automation engineering masters, but I did look a lot into getting more automation engineering type classes that I could have added to my curriculum. And to be honest, between how Northeastern just didn't offer every class every semester and just not having a great selection, I wasn't able to do that very much. There was process controls, which was actually a requirement. So, I mean, there was there was that. And then, but I was able to pick up material characterization techniques as well, which is kind of more in the, the PAT realm. I would have picked more of those classes if I could. Nice. Because you already knew that you wanted to focus in this field. Yeah. Okay. And talking about that, if maybe you can go back in time and they, they let you add maybe two or three courses on that, what would you remove? I feel bad for saying this, but it probably would have just been some of the required humanities. They weren't bad, <laughs> but they... That's classic. But it's like, when you think about how much you're paying for, for university, it's like, hmm, I really need that for that much money. But if we can find our choices to the realm of possible, um, I guess maybe the least relevant for me was that some nanomedicine courses I took, because that was more focused on, hey, if you want to start a startup, and I was like, I don't want to start a startup. But it was it was still like interesting and fun to learn, and almost every class was like that. Yeah, and actually, you never know when you're going to end up using such subjects. For instance, I had accounting and marketing, and at the moment, I was like, "Why the hell do I have these courses? Those are like for marketing guys and accounting 
doesn't make that much sense. But now that I'm working, I understand a lot of it. Thank God I had like accounting for my taxes and for for all my, let's say, money finances I have. And the marketing is what I do. I need to sell stuff or courses or what, whenever you have a product, you got to have the marketing. So now I see why are they in my syllabus. So never underestimate some subjects. Maybe some humanities can be uh, underestimated, but yeah, who knows? Maybe it was U.S. history. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you never know, man. You never know. Okay, what else we have here? What's your favorite chemical uh, engineering book? Um, so uh, I didn't read very many textbooks. I don't learn well from them. I mostly just uh, stayed in class, took good notes. Uh, and that was kind of my strategy. But a lot of my peers really liked the uh, Transport Phenomena book, and it was like from Bernstein Lightfoot, or so, I, th I think was the name. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how they like it. It's very co not complex, but not in a chemical engineering approach. It's very unique in, in its field. So a lot of tensors, a lot of hardcore, well, not physics, but I don't know what's the area to say, but it, it's not one of my favorites. But yeah, it's okay it's nice for myself so will you do you have it i technically yes i think it's on my computer somewhere because who buys physical textbooks these days yeah <laughs> you never know i i did have some books but as you said right now there are like two or three uh editions or versions be older so yeah they have the content that i need and i know where to find it but if i want to use the the new ones I will not be able to find them easily. So talking about books, do you use any of the books as reference or do you go online to get your reference? Yeah, not on, I was specifically working in automation engineering. So there's not a lot of pure chemical engineering concepts that I could ever really apply. I have referenced my process engineering notes once or twice, but yeah, ultimately I I, I know I haven't been looking back on those very much. This is also maybe a more like focus for life approach question, but what do you think about, okay, so you had your bachelor and right away you did your master degree almost, let's say in the same stage of life. So do you think, or would you go back in time and maybe just study your bachelor, go to the workforce, maybe two, three, four years, and then get your master's degree. So what do you think are the advantages and disadvantages of both uh, ways? So at least in my case, again, with the co-ops is that my, my academic life was interspersed with actually working in the industry. I, yeah, and then there's also the fact that because it was a combined master's program, it was just generally both financially and just time efficient to do something like that. But if, if I didn't have co-ops and if the combined master's program was not an option, yeah, I probably would have just tried to go straight into industry after my bachelor's. Yeah, I also think what that, that's what I did, actually. I just uh, finished my bachelor, go directly to the industry. Then I wanted to do my master's degree, but I started doing some stuff on my own, my projects. And so far, I'm here and I, I don't think I will be doing a master's degree any soon, so... I do think that doing a master's degree must be done before your thirties. So what do you think? Do, do you think there is an age for master's degrees or, or what's your scope? I think it I think it's 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 attractive to, to employers. Yeah. <laughs> it, it it I I think it really all depends on kind of your, where you're trying to go into. It's good to specialize, you know, just, just general advice like that. Yeah, that's also true, depending on what industry you're focusing. Maybe if you're into research or something very innovative, or maybe you want to be uh, updated on that. But if you're in production or something like that, manufacturing, maybe you just want to be working and learning on the process as you go. Yeah, that's. I think that's generally true, is that you higher, like very high education is, is generally, I think, more geared towards a research environment. And I kind of went into industry. Mm, favorite engineering subject? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, I think I was, I think I was uh, kind of stuck between process controls, kinetics, differential equations, and transport two. I found all of those really fun and fascinating, but I feel like I might be biased a little bit because between those four uh, subjects, it was by two 
two professors, both of which who were tremendously helpful and tremendously enjoyable. So that that could influence my yeah, my definitely. Uh, professors always have something to do on the subject. You cannot just get rid of that. So if you have a nice experience and you enjoy because sometimes it's also that the professor make it very ha easy to learn it and you enjoy it and then you see that maybe it's overall or in general the perspective of that subject it's that oh no this is a very hard uh, subject so you enjoy it and you say yeah i actually enjoy it so i like it so that what you were saying i had that for my reactor engineering course which most of my let's say classmate had a lot of problems but i really enjoyed it because my professor was a crack he was like awesome very straightforward Never i I think that's actually the equivalent of, of kinetics here. I think uh, some other some other uh, courses call that uh, reactor design. Because I, when I hear kinetics, it sounds mostly for maybe before going to the actual reactor design. So maybe you learn more. Okay. No, it was it was all about reactor design. Okay, 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 nice, nice. And talking about subjects, what is the subject that you hate or that you had a lot of problems with? <laughs> Personal finance. Uh, funny enough, uh, that was the lowest grade I got in the entire university, and it was a C plus, and that was my last semester. And let's be honest, no one really cares about some elective you took to fill a slot when it didn't really matter in the end because you were already going to graduate. <laughs> true, true. But why did you select the finance? Did you wanted to learn that, or was it because you had a easier, I don't know, maybe uh, scheduling it, or you wanted something easy? I felt like. It was, yeah, probably going to be a little easier. And then also that I wanted to, I felt like it was probably worth my time to kind of figure out how to adult. That's true. Uh, I also think that whenever someone hears finance, it's okay, some subject to fix my adulthood and maybe personal finance will be there as well and so on. Okay, Daniel, let's pass to the professional life section here. So did you have any non Kemi job, or maybe that it's not related to your curriculum, not your internships, not your co-ops. Maybe you work as a server or in the retail company. So I only had one, and I worked at a as a pool maintenance person between high school and university. Yeah, it was it was kind of long hours doing mostly like weeding, but I was able to put on my resume that I had worked with chemicals because you need to you know add like uh, pH and other substances in order to control the conditions of the pool okay that sounds very clever uh, to add it in the resume that you work with chemicals in order to clean the pools and was it by yourself or did you have a uh, i don't know maybe a mentor on that yeah i worked i worked again a lot of more more simple stuff so i worked directly with the owners it was a, it was a small pool uh, funny enough my one of my best friend from high school independently we did not coordinate this also applied for the exact same position and we ended up working together more than half the time <laughs> okay that's nice that's great it's always nice to have someone known what do you think are the top skills for chemical engineers requiring the industry maybe or maybe just as a recent graduate i think i think the top skills of a chemi if you know if you just give a chemi some problem then because of how like how much variety there is in the background of the you know the coursework and stuff they can just isolate the parts find the tools they need to analyze build or repair or whatever in order to solve the problem and then come back and tell you if it's economically worth doing okay that's actually the definition of a project engineer working with chemical uh, plants so that's great nice to hear it from you new question If you could trade jobs with someone, it can be either one day, a week, month, a year, whatever time lapse you want, who would you trade jobs with? Maybe one of those like uh, big hedge fund managers because, you know, that's a, that's a lot of money. And, and, you know, like economics is just numbers. I am an engineer who is good at with numbers, so I should be good in, with economics, right? Is that how that works? <laughs> Hopefully it, it, it works like that. So, do you actually do some of like investment on by yourself or still not doing that? No, I have no idea how stocks work. <laughs> I should I have always this little like reminder that I should be learning and doing it by myself and investing and uh saving for retirement and all that and I just keep procrastinating 
and hopefully one day I will end up doing it. But right, right now, right now I have a lot of debt I need to pay off, and I'll I'll think about investing once that's true. Yeah, that's true. One of the rules of finance is eliminate all kind of debt, or especially those like student loans. Yeah, it's just it's just. Uh, and loans. then you think, okay, what's your dream job? So you can select like the final version of your job. Which one will it be? I had the opportunity to get my dream job, but they just did not provide the right compensation that I needed. But basically, it would just be working at a company maybe slightly smaller than the one I'm working at, and I and just has its it, you know it's it's it mits in like every every kind of different industry. And in that setting, I would just be the go-to guy where my job is just to sit there and to be called in to solve whatever unique and baffling issue other people run into. Okay, that's a very interesting job. So. What's the name of the job? I don't think it ha it was like a, it had a specific name for a position, and if it did, I, f I forgot it. But it... Uh, okay, Daniel, what do you think are overrated jobs in chemical engineering? Some jobs that you say, nah, this job sounds very fancy. Everyone like respect that, and the actual job is not that heavy or that difficult or great. I think so. I think a lot of people will. Speak you know, cite statistics on how much money you make if you go into the oil industry. But what I feel like they leave out a lot is how much, how unstable it is. You'll be, you'll be making bank for months and then you'll be unemployed for months after. I mean, in average, it's probably, you're still making a lot of money, but um, I, I don't know. I would not be able to deal with that. <laughs> yeah. Also, the job is actually very hard, like just going offshore or drilling uh, wells and maybe you work, Like 24 hours one day, you rest 12 hours, and then other 18 hours, and very extreme locations. Most of the positions I was uh, I was aware of were more on the on the back end, where you're you're more working remotely with with design and and refinery. And oh, stuff. okay, okay, okay. Nah, that's that sounds even better. I think it sounds cool designing the something on refining or petrochemical part. But yeah, you stated oil and gas is very, and especially in The late 10 years, this last 10 years, it's been very crazy. Right now, I, there's like not so many consumption of oil, so a lot of jobs are gone. Hopefully, our colleagues in the oil and gas have found a job in other fields. Okay, Daniel, let's go back now to underrated jobs, some type of jobs that you think must be respected or maybe they must earn more money due to their responsibilities or value to the company but they are simply not seen or analyzed i mean i'm not sure if this really follows the definition but when I, it's like i feel like some people avoid startups because it's like well if i go there then i'll just end up being a gopher like i'll have to just do you know some sort of menial task that they really haven't expanded large enough to you know economy of scale remove it or hire more specialized people but i feel like having that experience with a lot of different elements even if it isn't design it's just i am cleaning this glassware it still is is good good experience and it's, it's good exposure and hey maybe you'll be talking with the people who are actually designing that and getting a good sense of you know what what are their jobs like so it's, it's a good opportunity okay it sounds fair since daniel now this This question, actually, I typically ask just for the sake of having some laugh or joking around, but I do know that automation requires this. So let me know if you actually use Laplace transforms or maybe uh, you use them in your, let's say, programs or methodologies or simply you do, do not use them. Uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't ever used them. There was a brief talk at one point where it came up and that was about it um a lot of it is i feel like i feel like a lot more of that that kind of design element is more for the process engineering side where us automation engineers are a lot more about implementation so it's like we're given the equation already and then we just have to make it work i see now still i i've, I've asked some process engineers and still haven't found any chemical engineer that uses The Laplace transform. Actually, I had one talk that what this guy told me that he used it, but just for like fun. He was like modeling this. Uh, I think it was a a tank, and he model like he said. I know I could do very simplistic uh, calculations, but I wanted to perfectly model the the tank, and he used a Laplace transform. 
But so far, it appears to be a very theoretical concept that we do not use in real life. I had fun with it in process controls. I also did. I enjoyed it so much for differential equations, but I also knew that well, I don't know if I'm going to be using this in the actual industry. And yep, so far I didn't use it. So that's why I always ask because it's important to mark to the students or let's say future chemical engineers that we learn a lot of things just for the sake of learning, like more things for engineering, but they will open your, let's say, mind or how you attack problems, but you will not be using them in the industry. These next two questions, what is the best advice you were given and the worst advice? So the best advice is, I think I've already stated this, but get work experience, get an internship, get an opportunity to see what the job is like, how to apply, how to negotiate, all of that is super important skills that you should try to at least get before you graduate and go off to wherever. The worst advice, I feel like chemical engineers are like, un in general, an honest bunch. I haven't really gotten, I can't think of any. Okay, that's great because it means that you're optimistic. So all the bad stuff just go, enters your brain and goes away. A quick tip for resumes, now that you got many, let's say, uh, applications. So what do you think is a success on resumes? I feel like some people, like I, I've, have, I've helped some of my, call, my, my, my friends um, put together their resumes. And one thing is, is that they're, they're always, they're always like, well, my resume is looking light. And I feel like they have a lot of opportunity to go into further detail and just kind of describe more precisely of, of like what, what the projects they worked on, um, just just kind of show that you understood what you're putting on your resume. It might not be more standard to go into such low levels, but I mean, if you have the space, you might as well. And you know, companies will understand, and they might appreciate you showing that ability. Okay. Yeah. True. Uh, always, if you have some ability, especially if it actually fits to the profile they are looking for be specific and describe it. Daniel, this is very nice fit for you. What do you think is the future of the industry 4.0? I hear the words and I don't remember exactly what it's all about, but in terms of the future of chemical engineering, I think we're fairly robot proof. If you've worked with Aspen, you need to have a human in the loop to, to interpret things. You know, you can't have your column going down to 50 Kelvin, which was a problem I had because of some trace gases. Um, you know, even if the equations are increasingly done by algorithms, you still need a human design element. And then in terms of more general specific aspects, as I think we're going to see a lot more of safety and environmental concerns uh, implemented in curriculums um, even more so than now, I think that's going to be a, a big focus. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing more engineers get into the green energy space as well. Yeah, I also think chemical engineers are kind of hard to replace. Of course, they can be replaced in some cases, but overall, as you said, it, you need a human with proven chemical and process engineering knowledge. Automation is also another example in which you cannot automate. Well, it's kind of kind of meta, automate the automation. You don't want every single, you don't, you don't want to hire like 12 operators to stand in front of valves. It's not very efficient. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. But the other hand, you want to maximize the profits and while well, removing labor, it's also one of the important tasks for engineers. And the regulators like it too, if you're highly automated. In my experience, we had this like polymer plant, which uh, served the textile plant, which I was working. And the polymer plant was very automated compared to the textile plant. So it was like, wow, we are in the same company. And the part that goes into polymer, it's like way automated compared to the textile part. So that, that was funny to compare. Okay, so now let's pass to the random facts questions. So Daniel, what are you a fan of? The, let's say the motivator when you're sleeping maybe or when you need to have a delivery so is it coffee tea energy drinks i don't do any of those actually i tend to avoid sugar just because it's not not for health reasons and then caffeine gives me headaches the 
most I so I mostly end up just drinking water and occasionally see or calorie drinks. Okay, that's great for your health. So, but how do you cope for let's say uh, if you need to do you have a delivery every night? You just wait for it, uh, keep working, and avoid sleeping. Yeah, I just kind of work through it. Although I don't think I've ever done an all nighter, not through any, any of my years at school or any of work. I just I don't know. I'm good with deadlines. Yeah, actually, it's way better. It it's not only good for your health, but it also shows a lot of like discipline on on your behalf. So, as a boss, it's of course way better to have these deadlines and all the delivery on time rather than the typical guy that's yeah, it will be due yeah tomorrow night will be there. Daniel, do you have any hobbies? And if so, which are they? So, kind of out of left field, like this is entirely unrelated to engineering. Is that I actually do art like i'm a i'm a bit of an artist okay kind of more that sounds interesting a automation engineer with art yeah just kind of um you know dnd fantasy art i do character portraits for that and it, it's it's pretty relaxing and when did when did you start the drawing uh, since kid or high school yeah when i when i could hold a pencil that's that's when it started <laughs> okay since and then uh, just, two or three years old yeah and i just never stopped I've read a lot of uh, things on drawing that it helps a lot to the other side of the brain. And especially for us chemical engineers, which have a lot of like logic and space for like, all that, which is like, I, I don't know the right side, but the drawings and arts are the other side. So you are balancing your, your brain. That's great. There, there was a, few, a bit of an intersection. First of it is, is it's, I, I can make good diagrams for, for sp specific presentations or whatever. And then back in Transport 2, which, as you may remember, was one of my favorite classes, we had an opportunity for to basically do a project where we would be conveying some concept that we learned um, in the course, and we had different mediums that we could pick, and one of them was a comic book. So I drew an eight-page comic about heat exchangers, and that was fun. Comics, that sounds also great. Actually, one of my dreams is to, I don't know, maybe... Uh, produce some comics uh, related to engineering. I don't know. It will be cool to see some like engineering daily life in comics. Yeah, I'm 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 very interested in in the kind of intersection between ed education and that. If I had the time, I would totally try to set up my YouTube channel as as something where I would do one of those educational type formats where you would use you know still images that I would draw myself in order to con to, to teach about like engineering or writing, which is another one of my interests. But uh, at the moment, I, I don't really have the time to do it, but I do have the means. That's great to hear. And do you have any hobbies that you want to explore or develop eventually? Oh, well, yeah, that, that kind of kind of was it. Aside from, you know, art, writing, I play the piano, and I still occasionally do that. I'm trying to learn Spanish right now. <laughs> piano is also nice. Uh, music is something important to I try to develop. I actually started playing the saxophone, but since the pandemic, I haven't been inspired to play it. Mm -hmm. So I should retake it. Okay, Daniel, final question. Uh, do you hear listen to other podcasts? I used, to, uh, yeah, back when I was working at Continuous, there was a lot of times where I was just doing lots of repetitive sample making, and that was kind of where I got into podcasting in the first place because a lot of re repetition is good to have that kind of mental prompting. Um, basically, my two big ones were Hello Internet and The Adventure Zone, which is a DD and d podcast. Hey, it's another interest of mine. As of now, I don't do it very much because I'm at home most of the time. So it's usually I'm working on something a little more mentally taxing and I, I really can't have someone talking in my ear in the background. I also relate. I need to either focus in the podcast or... Well, I, I really listen to podcasts when I was in the gym or commuting, but when I'm working, it's kind of hard because either I hear something interesting or I'm working. So it's, I'm not that great in multitasking. Mm -hmm. So Daniel, that those were the questions I wanted to ask you. I don't know if you want to make a final conclusion, some tips, comments for our audience, some young engineers or students, maybe? No, I'm just going to hammer home the fact that you should get some industry experience as soon as you can, really. There's no, there's really no, there's no harm in even just practicing the art of doing interviews and putting together a resume. Because like, it's, it's, it's really 
a win situation, even if you don't get a position. True, true. Uh, interview practicing, even though you don't want that job, it's also a good way to get better in the interviews. And then when you actually need to be good at the interview, you will be able to do so. So practicing, sending CVs, all that helps a lot. So Daniel, thank you very much for being here, taking this time to share your story. Thank you for having me. You're more than welcome. Hopefully we get to talk in the future. And guys, this was Daniel Bosberg, a automation engineer for the pharmaceutical industry. And we will see each other in the future. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the episode. And before you go, I will really appreciate it if you take the time to share this podcast with your fellow colleagues, classmates, friends, or really anyone that might be interested on the topic of chemical engineering and its related fields. If you found this content helpful and valuable, please consider subscribing, writing, and leaving a review. Thank you so much for your support. It really means a lot. Thank you.